This is Religion and Theology, a podcast from the Center for Theology and Religious Studies. On the 25th of May, 2023, the Sterling Professor of Religious Studies in Classical Judaica at Yale University, Christine Hayes, gave a lecture on the occasion of receiving an honorary doctorate from CTR and the Faculty of Theology. Karin Setterholm of CTR will give a word of introduction. It's a great pleasure to introduce Christian Hayes, Sterling Professor of Judaica at Yale University. I'm so happy that you accepted the honorary doctorate and that you're here. And I'm especially happy because Christine Hayes is my role model for two reasons. She's exceptionally smart and she's kind and open-minded, always ready to engage in discussions over new ideas and reassess old ones. She is one of the best known and celebrated authorities on rabbinic Judaism in the United States and a much sought after lecturer in Jewish communities. Yet she is always ready to, to talk to any scholar or student. She has a genuine love for her research. She has written extensively on rabbinic Judaism and I will just mention a few works here. In her most recent monograph that you can see here, What's Divine About Divine Law? She traces two competing conceptions of what it means to say that law is divine. The Greek tradition, according to which natural law based on reason is divine by virtue of its inherent qualities, rational, universal, immutable, and conforming to truth on the one hand. And then on the other hand, biblical law that is seen as divine because it's grounded in the will of a divine being and not necessarily uh, rational, universal, immutable or conforming to truth. So in this book, uh, the, the encounter during the Hellenistic period between these two conflicting conceptions of divine law led to a variety of Jewish responses that uh, Hayes traces from Philo and Paul to the rabbis. And for this book, she was awarded a National Jewish Book Award and the Jordan Schnitzer Award from the Association of Jewish Studies. Her interest in law led to an affiliation with the Tel Aviv Law School, and she's also the editor of the Cambridge Companion to Judaism and Law. And she was also for many years the one edit or editor of the Encyclopedia of the Bible and its reception. Another area of research is Jewish identity. In Gentile impurities and Jewish identities, she examines the ways purity language is employed to construct Jewish identity from the Bible through the literature of the Second Temple period to rabbinic literature, and the diverse approaches to Gentiles and conversion in these sources. And the book that I think most of you are familiar with is the introductory book, The Emergence of Judaism, Classical Traditions in Contemporary Perspective that we use here in several courses. For many years, she's taught undergraduate courses on the history of the biblical and Talmudic periods, as well as advanced text courses and graduate seminars at Yale. A very warm welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Karen, for that, that welcome and introduction. I'd also like to thank uh, Dean Borchehammer and the faculty of the School of Theology for bestowing upon me this honorary degree. It's a tremendous honor indeed, and I'm both grateful and humbled to be recognized in this way. And I use the word recognized for a reason. Such honors recognize, that is, they acknowledge the existence and importance of academic work. And that is no small thing when the academy, and the humanities in particular, are increasingly under attack in so many parts of the world, including in the United States, where I, I teach and study. There are undoubtedly several reasons for this situation, but I would like to focus on what I see as a particularly potent contributor to the declining recognition of the value of the humanities, and that is an aversion to the uncertainty 
and fear that can arise from what the humanities offer us, an encounter with that which is different or unknown. I'd like to unpack that statement over the next 39 minutes and point us towards a better future by sharing with you something of my own academic path and the serendipitous discoveries that have enlivened my intellectual journey until now. So first, a little about my academic path. That a person of my background should become a scholar of ancient Judaism, the Talmud and related literature in particular, is admittedly surprising by my background, referring to the fact that I'm a non-Jewish female named Christine, no less, uh, who came of age in Australia, but left the Antipodes to pursue her academic dreams in America. Though I had no idea at the time that Jewish studies, and particularly the study of the Talmud, lay in my future. But that alone attests to the power and the promise of the humanities that can infuse us with a passion for, an un for the unknown and a desire to make it our own. So from an early age, I was fascinated by what I like to call the big questions. Why am I here? Why are other people here? And how are we to occupy ourselves in this passage from cradle to grave? Some attempt to answer these questions by employing the tools of reason to construct static and rational explanatory systems. Others, unconstrained by the demands of rational argumentation and unwilling to abstract from lived experience, tell stories to make sense of this world and our place and purpose within it. And while I saw the value of both approaches to the big questions, I was drawn particularly to the storytellers, to the dynamic tales and myths and cosmic and national histories that people tell to explain why we're here and why the world is as it is and what we are to do with the life we've been given. So at 19, I traveled halfway around the globe to attend Harvard University, convinced I would major in philosophy to answer the big questions. But after a few weeks in the prerequisite logic course, I decided, with the impatience of a teenager, that if P then Q was not going to help me answer the, to understand how humans have grappled with the big questions. For a few months, I considered the study of history, in which I had a consuming passion, or literature, which also captivated me. But I finally realized that the study of world religions um, brought together all of my interests, because the study of religion is the study of human beings as they have grappled throughout history with the big questions of human existence through story and philosophy, song and poetry, ritual and art, myths of cosmic origins and national histories, law and ethics. I'd found the intellectual home that encompassed all of my interests, but I was still unaware of the serendipitous discoveries that awaited me. I was fascinated by the diversity and complexity of the world's religious communities and cultures, but I soon discovered that I was inexplicably ignited by my Jewish studies classes and my encounter with Jewish texts, ideas, and culture. Such passions like tastes in music and art and food, I think defy explanation, but one moment in particular is etched in my memory as the moment that would set my path into this unknown and unfamiliar world. It was the fall of 1980, my second year at Harvard, and it was shopping period when students visit the opening classes of many courses before finalizing their choices. Although a course on Jewish history from late antiquity to the Enlightenment was actually rather low that semester on the long list of exciting courses I wanted to take, I decided to attend the introductory, le the introductory lecture delivered by the late and very great Professor Isidore Tversky. Professor Tversky said in this lecture, and I paraphrase, if you have taken a course in Western history, you will have been presented with a canonical account of the history of the West arranged as a coherent narrative detailing a sequence of significant events in a chain of cause and effect. If you learned anything about the Jews along the way, it was as an aside, an episodic footnote, not an integral part of an otherwise coherent narrative. For example, by the way, in the Crusades, a number of Jews were killed. But in this class, he said, you will be presented with an account of the history of Jews arranged as a coherent narrative with its own causal sequence of events. And from this perspective, certain events of Western history might appear differently. They may become episodic footnotes. After taking this course, for example, the year 1492 will take on a new meaning for you. What he meant, of course, was that the year most American students associate with Columbus's discovery of America would take on a different importance as the year of the expulsion of the Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, setting up a wave of immigration throughout Europe and the Mediterranean that would have significant consequences for both Jews and Europe more broadly. 
And I've said this on many occasions, and I repeat it here, that sitting in that classroom that day, I felt as if Professor Tversky had lifted my head from my shoulders, turned it around, and set it back down. I suddenly saw something I'd never seen before. My universe flipped inside out, and I, so certain of my perception of the course of Western history, was suddenly unmoored and uncertain, and I loved the feeling. The intellectual rush I experienced upon realizing not just that I didn't know everything, that was obvious, but that there was an entirely other way of viewing and narrating the sweep of human history, an entirely other way of evaluating the impact of events and persons, of perceiving, understanding, and experiencing the world. It was both humbling and exhilarating. And I knew in a flash that stepping fully into that alternative perspective and understanding it from the inside out, as if it were and always had been mine, was the desire of my heart and mind, and I wanted it to be the labor of my life. How serendipitous that I walked into that Jewish studies class that day to find something I didn't even know I was missing. And that's what education in the humanities is all about. It's a simple fact that humankind, in all its diversity and complexity, far outstrips the narrow and natural existence of any one of us. And that means that the study of the humanities will always bring us face to face with the other, indeed many others, a destabilizing and for that very reason exhilarating moment, without which there's no hope of understanding, connecting with, re respecting, embracing, and even valuing all that is different from or simply unknown to us. But that was only the first of many serendipitous discoveries I would experience as I plunged deeper and farther into the study of Jewish civilization, beginning with the Hebrew Bible, but focusing in particular on the emergence of Judaism in the first to seventh centuries of the Common Era. This was the period that saw the rise of the rabbinic movement, and over the course of more than half a millennium, the formation of rabbinic literature, a massive body of originally oral teachings, traditions, and debates, elaborating the meaning of the written Torah, or Hebrew Bible, and as I threw myself into these texts, the second unexpected or serendipitous discovery I made was that the notion of a single united Judeo-Christian tradition carried very little historical or theological validity. As Arthur Cohen pointed out, the notion of a Judeo-Christian tradition was a political invention of the Cold War era, asserted in the attempt to forge a united American identity opposed to communism. What became apparent to me as my study of late antiquity continued was that the idea of a single Judeo-Christian tradition asserted sameness where there was difference and stifled our ability to see the crucial and generative role that Jewish difference has played throughout human history. Indeed, it obscured what I was beginning to see as the radical and profoundly countercultural voice of both the Hebrew Bible and the rabbinic, the rabbinic movement. Let's consider the Hebrew Bible's countercultural conception of the divine. I'm sure you're familiar with it. The origin myths in Genesis broke with a long-standing ancient Near Eastern tradition that identified gods with various natural forces, the storm, the sea, and so on, and posited evil as a metaphysical reality. Instead, Genesis presented a single deity distinct from and sovereign over nature, a deity unopposed by a metaphysical evil, who created the cosmos not by defeating other divine powers, but by organizing inert and demythologized natural elements through an act of will. The Hebrew Bible adopted the creation myths of its neighbors and transformed them to convey a radically different conception of the divine, of the natural world, and of the worth and purpose of morally free humans. The Bible's radical counterculturalism and its expression through stories that appropriated and subverted the ideas and norms and literary conventions of surrounding cultures was mother's milk to the rabbis. And it's to the rabbis' further development of the Bible's countercultural conception of the divine and especially of divine law that I now turn. For it's my belief that the conception of divine law developed by the Talmudic rabbis has much to teach us about the value of difference in the face of sameness the value of uncertainty in the face of dangerous absolutisms, and the promise of a field like Jewish studies in an age of fear and polarization. The conception of divine law, as Karin intimated, that prevailed in Mediterranean late antiquity, a conception that the rabbis encountered and resisted, was a popular version of ideas innovated by the Stoics some centuries earlier. Prior to the Stoics, 
most Greek writers and philosophers, with some exceptions, saw nature, Fusis, as chaotic and disordered, a dog-eat-dog -dog world of competing powers. But the Stoics, for whom nature was coextensive with the divine, asserted that nature was ordered and governed by reason, or logos, which is itself divine. They, thus, they referred to this rational order, or logos, governing divine nature, as the natural law, nomos fuseos, or the divine law, theos nomos. This natural or divine law, this unwritten reason or logos, intelligible to the rational sage and the source of true virtue, is eternal, universal, immutable, rational truth. And in Greek thought, this unwritten divine law of nature can be contrasted to the laws posited by humans to govern a political entity. Human positive legislation consists of rules and prohibitions formulated in words that are grounded in the will of a sovereign entity. They're not necessarily true or rational. I don't stop at a red light because stopping at redness is a universal rational truth, but because some humans arbitrarily picked red to be the color for stopping. Human laws are not universal, but particular to the society they seek to govern. They're not immutable. They're contingent on historical circumstances. They differ from place to place and time to time, and they require updating and modification and sometimes annulment. And they can be written down unlike the divine law, which is unwritten logos. Positive human laws, unlike the divine law of, or reason, are coercive. They produce merely obedient bodies rather than virtual souls. So the stoic conception of the divine law, an unwritten logos or reason embedded in nature, universal, true, and unchanging, which would predominate in the Hellenistic East in popular form, differed dramatically from the biblical conception of divine law. So in the Bible, divine law is the covenantal legislation given to the Israelites through Moses at Mount Sinai and recorded in the Torah. Biblical divine law is not an unwritten rational order embedded in nature. It's a detailed body of legislation, written legislation, expressing the divine lawgiver's will for a particular people, its covenantal partner, Israel. It contains both rational and non-rational commandments. Some laws of the Torah are rational, but some, such as the dietary prohibitions and the purity taboos, are said to set the Israelites apart from other peoples, marking them as God's covenant partner. It can do that precisely because they are not rational, not universally recognized rational principles observed by all peoples. Moreover, the positive laws detailed in this divine covenant are not static and unchanging, but dynamic and responsive. Already in Moses' own day, some laws were modified to meet new historical circumstances. God changes the law of inheritance following the appeal of the daughters of Tzalafachad, for example. And Deuteronomy 17 describes the process by which the law can be applied to new situations after the death of Moses. So it should be immediately apparent that there's a severe mismatch between the Stoic and Hellenistic uh, conception of divine law and the biblical. Biblical divine law actually possesses most of the features that, according to the Stoics and to Hellenistic thought more broadly, were the traits of human law. It's particular to one community in one place, grounded in a sovereign will rather than universal reason. It's not necessarily aligned with truth, and it's subject to change. These are human laws. Finally, it was written. That's an impossibility for the Stoic divine law, which is unwritten logos, reason itself. And ancient Jews could not help but be aware of this incongruity between the biblical and the Hellenistic conceptions of divine law. It made them uncertain of the value and the dignity of their own tradition. But they responded to that uncertainty in different ways. For some, the uncertainty generated by the encounter with a different conception of divine law was distressing, and they wanted to make it disappear. These Jews admired Hellenistic culture and the philosophical conception of divine law, and they were eager to prove that the biblical law, the, the divine law of biblical tradition, aligned with it. Against the evidence of the biblical text itself, they claimed that the law given to Moses was divine according to the standards of the Hellenistic culture they so admired and emulated, which meant it was rational, universal, true, and immutable. We see these claims in the letter of Aristeus, written by a Hellenistic Jew Jewish author in the second century BCE, which asserts that the Mosaic law was not, quote, laid down at random, but with a, tr a view to truth, aletheia, and as a token of right reason, orthos logos, and that the dietary and purity laws, which appear unnatural and irrational, are in fact allegories for rational truths that lead to moral virtue. 
Similar claims are made by the author of 4th Maccabees, but as is well known, it is the first century Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria who goes the farthest in repackaging the positive legislation of the biblical covenant as the Stoic natural law. He declares that the divine laws delivered through Moses, quote, attain to the harmony of the universe and are in agreement with the principles of eternal nature, and that, quote, the laws and statutes are but the sacred words of nature, unquote. He maintains that the Torah is not particular and universal, and that, quote, someday each nation will abandon its particular ways and turn to honoring our laws alone, which are universal. He also asserts that the laws of Moses are immovable and unchanging like nature itself, and most surprisingly, that the Torah is actually unwritten. The written text we possess is just an icon or copy of the true unwritten Torah, which can be discerned in nature. So unsettled by the uncertainty generated by the incongruity between classical and biblical conceptions of divine law, some ancient Jews attempted to end that incongruity by bridging the two and erasing their difference. A second ancient Jewish response to the unsettling encounter with the Hellenistic conception of divine law is found in various writings of the New Testament. In these writings, too, the Torah is evaluated against the philosophical definition of divine law and deemed incongruous. But where Philo resolved the incongruity by simply attributing to the Mosaic Torah the qualities of Stoic divine law, several New Testament writers took advantage of the incongruity to differentiate and dismiss Jewish traditions as mere human law. In Mark 7, the Pharisees and scribes ask Jesus why he and his disciples do not follow tradition and wash their hands before eating. In response, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for following mere human law and abandoning divine law. Practices viewed by his fellow Jews as deriving from the divine law are dismissed by Jesus as human law. Paul was a first century Pharisaic Jew who also evaluated his native constitution, the Torah, against the Hellenistic dichotomy of human and divine law. And on many occasions, Paul attributed to the Mosaic law the qualities associated with the human positive law rather than divine law. He describes it as a law particular to the Israelite people and discourages Gentile observance, which he would not do were it a universal natural law. Now, as I've argued at length elsewhere, I believe that Paul's characterization of the Mosaic law was a strategic accommodation to his audience in service of his eschatological goal. Paul's goal was to hasten the kingdom of God by bringing Gentiles to the recognition of the God of Israel. He relied on biblical prophecies that described the Messianic era as a time when the nations would join with Israel in the worship of God, but not in the observance of the law, which in Paul's view is the privilege and reserve of God's covenant partner, Israel. To persuade his Gentile audience to join with Israel without joining Israel, Paul drew on the distinction between divine law and human law that would have been familiar to his Gentile audience. If the Mosaic law is the particular legislation of the Jewish people, then it need not obligate Gentiles whose entry into God's community, required if the end-time visions of the prophets are to be fulfilled, is effected through faith alone. In line with recent scholarship from the Paul Within Judaism School, a school that's flourished particularly here at, the, at Lund University, I've argued that Paul's eschatological vision is a paradoxical blend of inclusivism and exclusivism. Gentiles are included in the Messianic era, as per the biblical prophecies, but they are excluded from the law observance that in Paul's view was proper to Israel alone. So to discourage Gentiles from adopting the law to which he believed they had no right, Paul characterized the Torah as particular temporary legislation conducive to external obedience alone, not true moral virtue or salvation from sin. Paul's strategic but nevertheless negative characterization of the law as it pertains to Gentiles would later be misunderstood as an outright rejection of the law for both Gentiles and Jews. This would then set the stage for a more full-throated Christian denigration and delegitimization of the Mosaic law in toto and for the antinomian law-spirit dichotomy at the heart of early Christianity. But since that is a story that has been told by others more expert than I, I turn to the third response to the uncertainty generated by the incongruity between biblical and stoic conceptions of divine law, the response of the rabbis. Because it turns out that not all Jews were distressed by the incongruity between the Hellenistic and the biblical conceptions of divine law. Not all sought to deny the incongruity by turning Mosaic law into natural law, like Philo, 
or by affirming the incongruity, or to affirm the incongruity by, uh, and denigrate or dismiss the Mosaic law as mere human law, like some New Testament and early Christian writings. The rabbis, who flourished from the late 1st to the 7th century in both the land of Israel or Palestine and then Babylonia, saw the incongruity and were, generally speaking, neither alarmed nor apologetic, but exhilarated by the uncertainty engendered by this encounter with the other. Let me explain. Although there are exceptions, <clears throat> as one would expect, in a vast anthological corpus containing sources across six centuries, the rabbis, by and large, rejected the Hellenistic definition of divine law as a static and universal logos and doubled down on the biblical conception of divine law as a written body of legislation for a particular community grounded in the will of a sovereign divine being containing both rational and non-rational commandments subject to modification as needed and by no means corresponding to a single abstract unchanging rational truth. They did this through legal rulings, legal debates, and stories, many overtly humorous, that do not depict divine law as conforming to truth, as rational, and as immutable. Some brief examples of each of these three must suffice. First, reason. The Torah is not consistently represented in rabbinic texts as intrinsically rational or universally access accessible by reason. Indeed, in hundreds of rabbinic texts, the Mosaic law is portrayed as a divine decree containing some commandments that run counter to human nature or are so illogical as to inspire mockery on the part of other nations. The rabbis often delight in pointing to laws that could not be derived by logic and had to be given as commands of the divine sovereign. One particularly striking text consists of an extended celebration of the paradoxical irrationality of the law of the red heifer. This is a ritual that pur purifies persons from corpse impurity. The paradoxical and irrational nature of this ritual law is hailed as the proof of its divinity, a stark contrast to the apologetic and rationalistic approach of Hellenistic Jewish sources, like the letter of Aristeus or Philo, that divinized reason and felt compelled, therefore, to prove the rationality of even the purity laws. But for the rabbis, to declare reason divine is tantamount to idolatry. For the rabbis, divine law cannot be reduced to and is not exhausted by reason. Nor do the rabbis insist that the Torah's rulings align with various standards of truth, such as, for example, factual truth. We see this when the rabbis determine the law over and against empirical realities, tolerating legal fictions and contrary to fact rulings if doing so will achieve humane and compassionate goals. In one passage in the Talmud, women are presumed to be in a state of ritual purity when their husbands return from a journey even though this will not always be factually true, at least 25% of the time. But the facts are less important than promoting marital intimacy after separation and procreation. In another famous passage, the rabbinic court sets the calendar and the holy days in defiance of astronomical reality for various pragmatic reasons. Similarly, in judicial contexts, an uncompromising adherence to truth, assigning guilt and innocence by strict standards of justice without moderation by other values, is depicted in several rabbinic texts as dangerous. It said that Jerusalem was destroyed because people gave judgments according to the strict rule of the Torah, when they should have stopped short of the strict or formal law and exercised compassion. Another rabbinic source notes that Torah judges who render justice in a formally correct way that ignores particular circumstances are destructive. They cut through mountains, the rabbis say. A pious judge will contextualize the law, balancing strict justice with other important values. Peace, modesty, compassion, charity, and other virtues must sometimes trump the formal legal truth. God himself is depicted in many humorous narratives, defeating truth in favor of mercy and compassion in the heavenly court. As for the law's immutability, the rabbis resist the prevailing definition of divine law as something static and unchanging. The Talmud contains numerous rulings that adjust the divine law for the sake of the social order, for the sake of the public welfare. These are terms they use. For example, although according to Torah law, a husband is empowered to annul a divorce document without his wife's knowledge, the rabbis ruled that he may not do so, lest the poor woman mistakenly remarry, um, a change for the sake of the social order, they say. And on literally hundreds of occasions, the rabbis debate and explicitly modify the law in a deliberative response to changing historical, social, ethical, and ideological circumstances. Some texts suggest that humans are God's essential partners in the project of Torah. 
humans critique God's law and improve it based on their experience as embodied beings living in an uncertain world. In many stories, humans are depicted as advancing criticism of divine decrees, and sometimes the deity concedes, even declaring on three occasions, by your life you've taught me something, before then revising the divine law or principle in question. Indeed, in an oft-quoted text from the Babylonian Talmud, God is said to take delight in the rabbi's ability to defeat him in legal disputation. These often humorous texts depict a God in need of feedback and moral instruction by humans. The idea of a morally evolving divine being who gives a morally evolving law that is test-driven by humans, subjected to moral scrutiny and modified if necessary, stands at a great distance from the Hellenistic conception, according to which the perfect natural or divine law is an expression of a universally valid and immutable rational order. For a Stoic or for Philo, the idea of adjusting the divine law would make as much sense as adjusting the law of gravity. But for the rabbis, the responsive flexibility of the divine legislation of God's Torah is not a weakness, but a strength, not a bug, but a feature and an indicator of its origin in a dynamic and responsive divine will. This was a truly radical and countercultural position, and its dialogical engagement with Hellenistic ideas animates theological, ethical, and even secular legal and jurisprudential debates that shape our world today. In my remaining time, I'd like to consider why the rabbis refused to attribute to the Torah the qualities that the surrounding culture deemed to be the defining characteristics of a divine law, particularly its claim to a single and absolute rational truth. Well, after years of swimming in the ocean of Talmudic argumentation, I've come to the conclusion that the rabbis were suspicious. They were suspicious, if not downright skeptical, of dogmatic claims of absolute moral truth. I do not mean that the rabbis did not value truthfulness. They frequently and explicitly condemn prevarication and deceit, but they understood that there are some pursuits to which the categories true and false do not apply. In this respect, they resemble Aristotle, who noted that while universal, exceptionless truth may be attainable in purely rational domains like logic and geometry, it is unattainable in the realm of practical and moral affairs. When deliberating over the morality of an action, we appeal not to concepts of truth and falsehood, but to concepts of good and evil, which are not easily universalized and absolutized. However good a general rule or law might be in theory, and however well a previous moral decision may have served us in the past, it is entirely possible that it is not the best course of action in a new and slightly different circumstance. And so we must ask, do the demands of the hour indicate that a modification of the earlier rule or decision would be a better course of action. To determine what is best to do in any given situation requires a particularized judgment through moral reasoning. Moral reasoning does not prove that something is immutably true. It argues that something is, after consideration of all relevant factors, good today and maybe often. And if we deliberated well, then maybe for a really long time, but never absolutely and immutably because the circumstances of life are ever shifting and we can never imagine them all or take all possibilities into account. So with apologies to the Stoics, wouldn't a truly divine law, one that can support human flourishing now and in the future, have to be dynamic and responsive rather than absolute and immutable? Wouldn't it have to be open to moral critique and revision as new situations, new challenges, new insights, and new moral insights arise? The refusal to absolutize any one value, such as truth or rationality, should not be confused with the refusal of all values or with relativism. The rabbi's position is not a value-less position, but a value-rich position. Rabbinic sources eulogize many virtues and values and condemn many evils. Many virtues and values, especially truthfulness, compassion, and modesty, and they even will hierarchize them on occasion but they refuse to install any one value as permanently and absolutely supreme. They recognize that each moment of moral judgment requires the dynamic activation, weighing, and balancing of these strongly held values to determine the morally best course in any given situation while avoiding a dogmatic absolutism. To put it another way, the antidote for dogmatic absolutism, or a too rigid certainty, is epistemological humility, 
which embraces and even celebrates a healthy degree of uncertainty or skepticism. Recognizing that one has many good ideas and answers, but not all possible good ideas and answers, is the beginning of epistemological humility. And we are led to the recognition that we do not have all ideas and answers through the many disciplines of the humanities, which expose us to human diversity of all kinds. That is why we need the humanities, and especially disciplines like Jewish studies and Islamic studies that present such countercultural perspectives, to inspire a healthy and exhilarating uncertainty to foster an epistemological humility that is the best antidote for rising intolerance and dogmatic absolutism. Now, it may surprise you to hear that epistemological humility, the antidote for dogmatic absolutism, is enacted and inculcated on nearly every page of the Babylonian Talmud. To understand the anti-dogmatism of Talmudic argumentation, it helps to think of the Talmud as a kind of play that cautions us against becoming too certain of ourselves. Contemporary play theory defines play as a structured activity with an undetermined outcome, with some forms of play actively avoiding a final conclusion. The play of Talmudic argumentation about divine law and what it requires meets this description of play as a structured activity with an undetermined outcome, generating provisional meanings rather than unveiling a final and static absolute truth. One technique for avoiding a fixed and final conclusion in Talmudic argumentation is the endless multiplication of detail. Here's what Moses Mendelssohn, an 18th century Jewish thinker, had to say about detail. Take any proposition you please and talk, write, or argue about it, for or against it, often and long enough, and you can be sure that it will continue to lose more and more of whatever clearness it may once have possessed. <laughs> Too much detail obstructs the view of the whole. I suggest that Talmudic argumentation can be seen as a kind of play that involves an ever-increasing level of detail in a concerted effort to defer final answers and to keep the game going so that it doesn't freeze in a dogmatic rigidity. I wish I had time to demonstrate this claim by taking you through a passage of Talmud, but a summary description of just one of literally thousands of cases will have to suffice. In one Talmudic discussion, a certain rabbi says that a sukkah, the ceremonial hut that's constructed for the observance of the festival of Sukkot, a, one, uh, he says that a sukkah may be constructed using an animal for one of the three required walls. Another sage, Rabbi Meir, prohibits this. You were supposed to laugh at that, the idea of an... Okay, thank you. <laughs> the Talmud explores two possible reasons for Rabbi Meir's prohibition, noting that these two different ra rationales for his prohibition would lead to different rulings in certain particular cases. But which cases and how? And the game is afoot. A lengthy discussion of various animal walls that follows evinces a spirit of play, not only because imagining elephants or cows serving as a wall and inconveniently wandering away is humorous, but because of certain formal features that we see in every extended Talmudic discussion. The endless what-ifs. What if it's an elephant? What if the animal dies? The pro that propose increasingly detailed and specific situations. What if Rabbi Meir's prohibition was limited to a certain kind of animal in a certain situation? What if the animal runs away? What if it dies? What if it has such large gaps between its legs that it doesn't meet the legal definition of a wall? And on and off. The game continues because, as is true of any game, the real fun, the real purpose is in the playing, the exploration of possibilities. And although the Talmud's discussion stops where it stops, there's no genuine sense of closure. We never find out which reason for Rabbi Meir's prohibition is correct. And there's nothing to prevent us from coming up with yet a third possible reason or another contingent detail. The debate is potentially endless because new particularities, new contingencies are always possible, and that's the point. More important, the detailed objections, the hypothetical applications, reshape what we thought we knew. We thought that all animal-walled sukkahs were categorically prohibited by Rabbi Meir and categorically permitted by Rabbi Yehuda. But it turns out that may not be so. Exploring the reason behind Rabbi Meir's prohibition, we see that he might, in fact, make an exception in some cases, and suddenly we're a little less certain of ourselves. The Talmud doesn't press to determine which view of Rabbi Meir's reason is right. It's interested only in which views are possible. I deliberately chose a humorous and almost self-parodying example, but these same techniques are applied to every imaginable topic, even the most serious. Over and over again, we find out that what we thought was clear at the beginning is decidedly less clear at the end. And were we to consider a few more details, more hypothetical cases, things would probably look different again. The lesson? Think, reason, argue. To reach the best decision for the community today, 
but retain a modicum of uncertainty and epistemological humility because a new detail stimulating a better argument and a more moral outcome might be waiting just around the corner. Most scholars assume and argue that the Talmud's excessive argumentation and endless piling up of detailed distinction is driven by a desire to achieve certainty, certain knowledge, to uncover a single truth. I disagree. The Greek philosophers certainly understood that a preoccupation with detail is an impediment to the acquisition of true and certain knowledge. Aristotle said that if you want to know what a horse is, you have to ignore the particular details of particular horses. There are different colors and sizes and speeds and degrees of strength and so on. Instead, you must abstract from these particulars the ideal form or essence of horseness that is shared by and defines all individual horses. If you get bogged down in the concrete material details, this one is lame, this one has a long tail, you'll never see the abstract unity that transcends the diversity of the material exemplars. You'll never have certain knowledge of horses. By contrast, the Talmud is committed to detail. I believe it's designed to bring less certainty, because as I've argued, the rabbis believed God and God's law are not static, but dynamic and responsive to the details of human existence that arise anew each day. Therefore, even as they arrive at legal decisions for their community, because communal life requires it, in a deep sense, they know that these decisions are never final and unrevisable, never immune to exception and revision. The Talmud's style of argumentation reflects and enacts that belief. So where the Greek philosophers sought to stabilize knowledge and certainty through abstraction from detail, the Talmudic rabbis, I argue, sought to destabilize knowledge and certainty through distraction with detail, reminding us that when it comes to elaboration of the divine law, certainty is a dangerous illusion and that the quest for truth refers not to an instantaneous unveiling of the transcendent one, but to a continuous, historically embedded, and generative process of contingent interpretation. Thomas Malaby describes play as an attitude that, quote, draws ultimately on the pragmatist philosopher's portrayal of the world as irreducibly contingent, an attitude characterized by a readiness to improvise in the face of an ever-changing world. He cites Johann Huizenga, who wrote that the play element is, quote, marked by an interest in uncertainty. I might add that play depends upon uncertainty because play is, quote, a disposition toward the world in all its possibility, a disposition that recognizes the contingency of events and the compelling mix of constraint and open-endedness that imbues all of our actions, decisions, and social processes. A disposition, I would argue, that views uncertainty not as a terrifying abyss, but as a promising realm of possibility and is ready to improvise in novel circumstances to meet the demands of the hour. So Talmudic argumentation can be seen as this kind of play, introducing into the divine law an edifying element of uncertainty and contingency that unlocks a world of possibility and human moral agency. In this age of increasing extremism and dangerous absolutism of all kinds, we have much to learn from disciplines like Jewish studies that bring us face to face with countercultural possibilities, and much to learn from the ancient rabbis specifically their skepticism, their epistemological humility, their refusal to sacrifice the particular to the universe, and their embrace of, rather than paralysis from, uncertainty. This can be a model for our own moral thinking. The Babylonian Talmud's famously convoluted discussions remind us that just as the Jewish God is not the static, unmoved mover of the philosophers, but a dynamic living presence, so this God's divine law is likewise dynamic, always in process, that no interpretation of the moral law is absolutely final, that every answer is provisional because there is always the possibility of a new circumstance, an unanticipated detail that might demand revision, and that when implying the law in any new situation, we cannot be lazy and whip out a fixed preset answer we must roll up our sleeves, pay attention to the details, and figure out all over again what justice and equity look like in this case now, and that no position, however well argued and supported, is completely immune to further thought and inquiry, that everything is always, always in play. Thank you so much. Thank you.